I'm going to talk to you today about the idea of home, because that is what we are talking about today. And you see, is there anything more Irish than leaving Ireland? Um, <laughs> your leaving has sort of been bred into us over the generations. Um, our history and our ambition and our instinct for survival, you know, all favoured the leaving gene. You know, fight or flight. Well, if the fight's unfair, the odds uneven, your chances blighted, that's a pun, uh, well, <laughs> no contest, F flight, fast track, priority boarding, uh, arm rest down, place mask over nose and mouth. Um, but there's a funny thing about this lichen-covered, you know, peat-smeared rock of ours out here in the Atlantic. You can leave it, but it never leaves you, even if it pushed you out in the first place. It leaves a kind of brackish, stubborn stain that's almost impossible to remove entirely. You know, a biological mark eh, that's developed resistance to potions, both bio and non-bio. You can paint over it, you know, shiny new Dulux skin, you know, but eggshell, matte or gloss, it bleeds through your carefully chosen elephant's breath. <laughs> you know, paper over it, well, you can try, but, you know, flocked or embossed or star-spangled striped, you know, maroon or royal blue or even parchments, watermarked, you know, cards dollar green or papers that permit pasted rice on newly minted citizen chests and still our birthmark bleeds through. You know, being Irish is a bit like being a stick of rock. You know, the kind that mothers are pestered for at fun fairs and seaside towns from Bray to Salt Hill, Brighton to Coney Island. You know, it, because it doesn't matter where you pick us up or even where you break us open, because wherever you break us open, right down the centre, it will still say Ireland. You know, I left after college, like generations had before me, though unlike many generations before me, or many people before me, I didn't leave in a veil of tears and gnashing of teeth. You know, I was not a reluctant leaver. You know, I didn't just leave, in fact, I ran. I ran as far as I could away from this stifling rock, and I got as far as Japan. And as far as I was concerned at the time, I wasn't going back. And I didn't miss it. Sure, there were people that I might have missed, and occasional things, but I didn't miss the place. Well, I didn't miss Ireland, and why should I? It definitely didn't miss me didn't even like me at the time. And at the time, it made very clear that it didn't miss me or want me. And I was just fine with that, or at least I convinced myself that I was. Not that I thought too much about it. Um, I didn't really have the time. I was spending my time you know, running around Tokyo, running riot, and discovering that actually, I did actually like me. In fact, it felt like I was really meeting me for the very first time. I mean, the real me. Because, you know, back on that windswept Atlantic rock, which had been so contorted by its own particular history that it somehow managed to be both looking inward and backward at the same time, you know, I hadn't really been me. I'd only been a potential me. A potential but unrealized me. You know, a matte grey, monotone, caterpillar version of me. But in Tokyo, under the grow lamp heat of a billion neon lights, I metamorphosized, you know, like my friend Dorothy. You, you do know I'm a friend of Dorothy's. <laughs> um, at home, I'd been in black and white. But in Oz, I was in Technicolor and Stereoscope. But unlike Dorothy, I was in no rush to get back to dull Auntie M. In fact, I blamed poor old Auntie M for my caterpillar years and wanted nothing to do with her or anyone related to her. And if one did wander into my Oz, I would go out of my way to avoid them. You know, Ireland uh, and St. Patrick's Day are neither well-known nor much marked in Japan. But a few years into my Tokyo adventure, one March 17th, a date which I'd hardly even registered, to be honest, you know, arrived at the huge, you know, achingly cool nightclub where I was working at the time. It was housed in a seven-story industrial building, you know, large enough it was for me to fully unfold my still new iridescently colored butterfly wings and flit about from table to table under the giant disco ball. Well, in fact, that was what I was paid to do, you know, to touch down on a table and dazzle its guests with, you know, my flashy colours and my sparkling bon mot, and before gaily flitting off again, you know, trailing sequins and fun in my wake across the dance floor, before, you know, alighting on another table in a cloud of hairspray and sake soap squeals. But anyway, on this particular night, this particular March 17th, when I arrived, the manager, he said to me, you're from Iceland, right? And <laughs> I looked at him suspiciously and nodded slowly, agreeing that, yes, 
Yes, I was from Iceland. <laughs> which is something I had learned to do in Japan because it's just simpler and easier than trying to explain that Ireland and Iceland are different places. You know, in the same way that I also learned to just agree that yes, I must be very good at skiing. <laughs> <laughs> I was from Iceland. I thought so, he said, and he told me that he was expecting in a large group from Iceland tonight. They had reserved some tables because they were celebrating Emperor Patrick's Day, <laughs> and so that would be fun for me, right, to be able to celebrate the birthday of our Emperor Patrick with other people from Iceland. You know, why hadn't I told him it was Emperor Patrick's Day? Happy Emperor of Iceland Day. <laughs> Now, like I said, the club, it was big. Um, you know, it had maybe 60 or 70 staff at a night time, and Even I impressed myself that it only took me about 20 minutes to cover all seven stories and tell every single member of staff that they were not to tell the group from Iceland that I was also from Iceland. <laughs> you know, not to tell them that the drag queen was from Iceland, you know, working in the club. And never mind why, you know, just don't mention it. If anybody does ask, just say I'm from Australia. Of course, at the time, I hadn't learned yet that I was, ir you know, ir indelibly marked by this place, and even the colored lights of a dance floor on the other side of the world were enough to see right through me and reveal the brackish watermark of home. Now, things change, of course, and you know, I changed, and Ireland changed, and I wanted to be part of that change, and that stubborn stain of Irishness started to itch in a way, and all the scratching in the world, it turned out, wouldn't ease it, and so. You know, to no one's surprise more than my own, I suppose, I found myself back here. But I was back in an Ireland that was shape-shifting, you know, slowly, occasionally, rapidly, you know, in fits and in starts, um, not altogether painlessly and not without missteps, but it was changing nevertheless, reshaping itself you know, into a place with space for someone like me. Now, Dorothy and I had both had to leave Kansas to discover our full potential. You know, to realize that we could take on witches, we were as smart as any Emerald City wizard, you know, to find heart and courage and friendship on the yellow brick road or A1. Um, you know, to find ourselves and our hearts, and of course, I will miss you most of all, Scarecrow. Um, <laughs> and to discover that all along, home had actually been right under our feet, just three heel clicks away. And like Dorothy, I did click my heels together and back to Kansas, but my Kansas had finally gotten fed up of being in black and white and was digitally colorized. But we didn't have to go back to Kansas, Dorothy and I, we chose to. You know, we could have, like some of my guest Dorothys today, uh, we could have chosen instead to make Oz home We could have taken that you know, indelible stain of Kansas and decorated it and celebrated and made a house and a home out of it. A little bit of Kansas in the middle of Oz. You know, maybe a country cottage on the edge of the haunted forest, just off the yellow brick A1. Um, or maybe a chic apartment in a ta gleaming tower smack bang in the middle of Emerald City. Because it turns out that Glenda the Good Witch was right all along, and home has always been right under your feet. <laughs> 